of death, thrombocytopenia is only an issue in cirrhotic patients, but sometimes limits therapy. The other one worth mentioning is that about 1 to 2 percent of persons will develop thyroid disease. Now this is obviously more common in women, but I tell all my patients about it because this is potentially irreversible. All these other things when you stop therapy go away after 4 to 8 weeks. However, some patients do require Synthroid indefinitely due to hypothyroidism induced by the interferon. This is an autoimmune type process. Another tool to limit toxicity, I mentioned one with the use of SSRIs and EPO, is week 12 predictions of response. I mentioned earlier that when someone responds, it doesn't take a long time to tell. And in fact, within 12 weeks, if the person you're treating has not dropped their hepatitis C viral load by greater than 2 log 10, the odds are less than 1% that they will obtain a sustained virologic response, a very high negative predictive value of about 99%. So you can tell a subject who's failing to respond in week 12, we can stop therapy because there's a less than 1% chance to achieve virologic response. On the other hand, the person that's responding has a fairly high positive value, about 70 to 80 percent that they will achieve a response. So one of the things you'll see in practice today is stopping patients who fail to respond at week 12. Now there is a role for continuing treatment of those with advanced disease, oftentimes dropping ribavirin. This is known as maintenance interferon therapy. Now, which patients should be treated? Well, today all patients are treatment candidates, but the biopsy plays a crucial role. Patients without fibrosis that is no scar and liver biopsy can safely defer therapy. The ALT is not an important determinant on who should be treated or who can safely defer. A biopsy is the most important tool. The biopsy is what tells the patient their prognosis. I would, however, suggest that we can treat patients with genes like 2 or 3 without biopsy, and we now routinely offer our patients treatment if they want it. Now, I mentioned acute hepatitis C treatment. If you find a healthcare worker who acquires hepatitis C through a needle stick, there is strong evidence published by Jackal that treatment in the first six months can lead to eradication of virus and prevent persistent infection. In my view, the standard of care today is to get a hepatitis C RNA in that healthcare worker four to six weeks after exposure and consider treatment with interferon or interferon plus ribavirin. There are a lot of unanswered questions, but treatment needs to be considered. The other group where treatment needs to be considered is HIV-infected patients. The era of HIV-AIDS is now a manageable disease. The recommendations are that all patients should be screened and that treatment should be considered on a case-by-case -case basis. And in our clinic here at Johns Hopkins, 50% of our HIV patients have hepatitis C, and our efforts are underway to try to treat these individuals as much as possible. Now, I mentioned future therapies. We're nearing the cusp of a very exciting time in hepatitis C. There are specific small molecules being designed to target the virus. Hepatitis C has a RNA polymerase and S5B region. There are now, in human beings, early studies of polymerase inhibitors. These are drugs that are designed to target this region. In addition, there have already been exciting data presented at the liver meetings last November about a protease inhibitor. The same target, albeit a different amino acid protease, that was so successful at HIV that in fact, in a small study of about 20 patients, a serine protease inhibitor from Behringer Engelheim induced a two-log drop in patients in only two days. We're looking at trials coming down the pike in the end of 2003 and 2004. Very exciting times for hepatitis C, although we expect the virus to become resistant to these pathogens. And we're planning for that, not unlike the situation with HIV. So today, as I've alluded to, the standard of care is pegaterferon ribavirin. Genes type 1, clearly more difficult to treat. You can quote a patient about a 45% probability of sustained virologic response. The treatment is for 48 weeks. Genes type 2 or 3, you can quote an 80% probability of response for only 24 weeks. The other key to success is aggressive toxicity management. The other key, in at least in the United States, is increasing access. There are high numbers of patients living in Baltimore who are not getting treated. There are a large number of patients within prisons and other settings that are not receiving care. In fact, it's estimated that only 1 in 10 hepatitis C infected patients have been treated with hepatitis C. We need to do a better job screening patients and considering therapy. We look forward to new treatments, but they are 4 to 5 years off from FDA approval. Dr. Solkowski concludes by answering questions.
A few weeks ago, I heard a physician posit very persuasively that most people who are being treated for hepatitis C don't need to be treated. Do you concur with that? I think the issue is in patients with minimal liver disease. The issue is taking patients with hepatitis C, doing the appropriate staging evaluation, that is getting a liver biopsy. I think you can safely tell patients with no hepatic fibrosis or very minimal portal fibrosis that deferring therapy is a viable medical option. This is the halfway point of the program. Dr. Solkowski continues. Now, if that person wants to be treated, we do offer them care. But I think the point is that their prognosis over the next five years, that same window of care treatment, is really quite good. The problem is, I've heard that translated to say that, well, I've got 100 patients in my practice that they see, and because the prognosis may be quite good, the chill and I win. So I think that kind of decision after evaluation is quite appropriate. And we probably defer therapy in as many patients as we treat. And in those patients in whom you do defer treatment, how do you follow them? Well, right now, I think there is a recommendation to follow serum ALT every six months. Now, for the most part, an ALT is a poor predictor of what's going to happen. Although there are emerging data from studies such as the ALIVE study here in Baltimore, the patient with a normal ALT will have a very good prognosis over the next three to five years. What we're telling patients is that we're going to repeat a biopsy in about four to five years after the first one to assess progression. Now, it may be that new therapies come, and as therapy if it gets better, my ops would be less important. Question for Dr. Sikoski. Yes. Yeah. Well, unfortunately, patients today, typically genotype 1 infected patients who fail adequate doses of peg interferon ribavirin, there really are no effective treatments. There are a number of studies. The concepts being studied today are things like peg interferon maintenance therapy, that is, placing them on a low dose of peg interferon, not 150 micrograms, but more like 50 or 90 micrograms, indefinitely try to prevent scarring. The TNF antagonist Remicade, there are studies of that agent to try to prevent fibrosis. And these patients may be eligible for new trials. For example, a lot of the new antiviral drugs, the polymerase and protease inhibitors, will be first studied in non-responders. But for many patients, unfortunately, there are no effective FDA-approved treatments. The lymphomas have been quite interesting. The ones reported in the New of Medicine were splenic lymphomas. So they have not been a gastric molt, if you will. They've been low-grade splenic lymphomas or low-grade lymphomas with the high circulating abnormal lymphocytes, but not necessarily the mucus-associated ones. They're pretty rare. That's a good question. The question was screening for liver cancer or hepatitis carcinoma, hepatoma. In hepatitis B, cancer can occur at all stages of fibrosis. Hepatitis C cancer is limited to cirrhotic patients. So patients without cirrhosis don't require regular screening. Now the recommendations for a cirrhotic patient is every six months ultrasound and serum AFP, although there is still not conclusive data suggesting that's a cost-effective strategy. The idea is to identify tumors early where curative options are still available. Speaking next, Bimo H. Asher, Assistant Professor of Medicine, Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine, with anemia, causes, detection, and treatment decisions. When you're thinking about anemia, really there's only three types of anemia. Either you're not making enough, you're making enough, but you're destroying what you got, or you're bleeding like stink. Okay? Three types of anemia, that's what you need to know.